Muy buenas tardes a todos y a todas. Good afternoon, es... everyone. My name is Diego Arrea, and I'm the deputy director of the Atlantic Council's Adrian Arsh Center for Latin America. It is an enormous privilege to be connected with you today as we continue our Visions of Change series, which is an initiative devoted to elevating the discussion on the perspectives of Venezuela's opposition candidates at a Venezuela's 2024 presidential elections. For this series, we've invited all of the Venezuelan opposition primary pre-candidates who, according to credible polls by pollsters Moore and data analysis, are polling above 15%. This series is not just about listening to candidate speeches. It's about fostering dialogue, understanding the situation on the ground, and promoting collaboration among democratic leaders and the international community. This is also about listening to Venezuelan opposition leaders who have devoted their lives to the fight for free Venezuela, Venezuela where the voices of people determine the course the country will take, where freedom moves forward and prosperity is a shared reality. Throughout the series, we will delve into a variety of topics, including the economic crisis, human rights abuses in the midst of primaries and then presidential election, the humanitarian crisis, seeking not only to understand the challenges, but also to go into detail about the solutions proposed by Venezuelan opposition leaders. <clears throat> Thus far, we have heard from Maria Corina Machado and Enrique Capriles. And to continue with this series, we have today none other than Delsa Solorzano. Delsa is a great friend of the Atlantic Council, a member of the Center Support Network for Latin America, which is a women's empowerment network. Founded in 2020, she is a founder of the political movement Encuentro Ciudadano, a champion of democracy and a tireless voice in defending the demands of the Venezuelan people. Her presence here is more important than ever. Venezuela stands at a crossroads. It is a nation that for years has been in need of political change, renewed hope for the restoration of democratic principles that are fundamental to Venezuelan's ident identity and that define us as a country. Our series seeks to explore the different dimensions of the struggle and to showcase the efforts of the Venezuelan opposition in their quest for a free and prosperous Venezuela. This morning, we will go a step further in welcoming Delsa Solorzano in the to the virtual stage. We'll have the opportunity to listen, learn, and join our efforts in solidarity with the Venezuelan people. Delsa is synonymous with resilience and determination and has been at the forefront of the Venezuelan political scene in recent years. Her commitment to democratic values is well known to millions of Venezuelans, both inside and outside Venezuela. To moderate this, I will leave you with my colleague, Jeffrey Ramsey, a senior fellow at the Latin America Center and who leads the Colombia and Venezuela portfolios. Jeff has vast experience in navigating politics in Latin America from Washington, D.C., and he has had an incredible impact on the work at the center. He has very close ties to the region. He is an activist in the cause of Latin America in Washington, D.C., and under his leadership, in the Venezuela and Colombian portfolios at the Atlantic Council will continue to expand. So ladies and gentlemen, I leave you with Jeffrey uh, Ramsey and Delsa Solorzano. Thank you so much, Diego. Before kicking off, I wanted to remind those of us joining on our social networks that we have simultaneous interpretation. If you go to atlanticcouncil.org, you can watch in either English or Spanish. The entire discussion will be held in Spanish, so the interpretation is available into English. I would also like to echo Diego's welcoming remarks. We welcome Delsa Solorzano here. We are deeply honored that you have agreed to join in on this conversation. Perhaps to get started, Ms. Solorzano, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, why you're standing for election in the primary elections? This is, and why should people in Washington be interested? First of all, thank you for inviting me to talk to you. 
and to share a different perspective with the Atlantic Council audience at this point. The Atlantic Council has been very interested in Venezuela's democracy and particularly focused on political training for women to close that gap that sadly continues to exist the recognition and acknowledgement of women in politics and men in politics. I wanted to thank the Support Network and the Atlantic Council for enabling us to have these opportunities to contribute to ensure that women have are able to enjoy the same rights. Who am I? I am a Venezuelan mother. I'm an activist. I am an attorney. I have also studied uh, human rights, uh, public management and administration. I have been a university professor and I am present on social media, both inside and outside Venezuela. I was a deputy in the Latin American parliament where I presided for all of Latin America over a very important uh, committee, which was about the prison systems. It was very important in all of the Latin American countries, but particularly in Venezuela, we have got to reform our prisons. We saw what they did in the Dominican Republic with and tried to devise a framework law for the region. I am, uh, as in terms of my time in the National Assembly, I drafted the most bills. I have also supported countless victims of human rights abuses in my time. So I've always been working to ensure that the transition in Venezuela is orderly, that it meets all of the standards it needs to. And I also think it's important to say that I am defending more than 300 victims before the International Criminal Court in terms of crimes against humanity committed against them. Okay, as a follow-up question, you were talking about a transition. Nevertheless, the Maduro government remains in power despite the authoritarianism. Do you think a transition is possible? And why, why does it make sense to talk even about elections in Venezuela these days, especially given the authoritarian environment on the ground? After a conflict or a dictatorship, what comes next for countries is always a transition. And the huge challenges, I'm not just talking about a political transition. As part of the political transition, we have to talk about justice, peace, and transition in this country where we saw violations of all human rights. At the same time, we have to talk about redress for victims, redress for victims. And if that happens, then that leads to justice. That leads to peace and ultimately to reconciliation. I think it is even reconciliation is what is most important because if not, we run the risk of repeating the situation we are already experiencing in Venezuela. I've been working 25 years for it, towards democracy and we could lose that overnight. The transition has to have a non-repetition guarantee. We have to prepare for a transition. What cannot transpire is recovering democracy and being unprepared to govern in the context of a democracy. In my particular case, we are preparing for a transition. Now, taking on a dictatorial regime, which is what we're doing in Venezuela, of course, that is a risk. That undoubtedly it's a risk. We have the enormous challenge of facing a criminal dictatorship using democratic channels. 
those of us who support democracy have no other choice. So these primary elections are fundamental. I cannot say today, okay, Venezuela, the conditions exist for free and fair elections. When we talk about free democratic elections, that the conditions are not in place for that. What will happen to somebody who is elected on October 22nd? That person will fight to ensure that we have free, fair, and verifiable elections, which is what we have been working toward for so long. For that, it's essential to coordinate. Coordinate with whom? First, with the other democratic forces in the country. I am firmly convinced, and that is why I am running for election, but I am convinced that without unity, there will be no liberty. First, coordination must exist amongst the democratic forces. If we do not unite, we are not going to be able to topple the dictatorship. And for that coordination to exist, we have to have the democratic forces come together. People have to mobilize behind these primary elections and show the international community that we are willing to do our part to ensure the free and fair elections. All of the countries, the European Union in the West, who all want to see democracy restored in Venezuela. And that third level of coordination will have to come and with those who have the government. We are going to have to discuss with them to ensure that this happens. This is not just about us having the right to come out and vote. It is the right to elect, to win, and to take over that trial. Talking about coordination now between the campaigns, in the recent debate that took place at the Catholic University in Andres Bello, where several of the main candidates for the opposition primary participated, you were quite firm in talking about a succession plan in case the winner of the primaries were disqualified, which has already happened to several of the candidates in this process. There are conversations underway about the possibility of creating this plan. That is, is there? And do you think that? Why is it? What is the why, What is the rationale for other candidates not being on board? We cannot say that we can end the dictatorship as if we were democ as if it were a democracy. The problem with dictatorship does not be end it cannot be ended by applying the constitution because we would have ended it. We would be in democracy right now. We are under a dictatorship, and dictatorship performs or acts as what it is. We have a few very clear examples over the recent years. Lavarinos was one of the most emblematic examples that we saw recently. The candidate who was elected in Barinas, after they were elected, they were disqualified. And the reality is that no matter how much people went out to the streets, there was no way to recognize the triumph of that candidate. And then his wife was disqualified, who wasn't even a public office holder. And they continued after that to disqualify additional individuals from different political organizations. For example, there were other people who were disqualified during that period. And after that, the democratic forces found a solution. That is, today we have the current Governor Garrido. So it doesn't make sense for us to not be prepared to face a dictatorship. The truth is that these disqualifications are unconstitutional. Three of the 14 who are registered for this primary have been disqualified. This disqualification is unconstitutional. And that's because we are in a dictatorship. If we were under a democracy, perhaps there would not even be a necessity of having these kinds of primaries because people would be able to go out and make a choice. We have to be united because we are under a dictatorship. But we also have the obligation to be prepared to make sure that we see whatever they do and be prepared for whatever they'll pull out. And then for it to be us, the democratic forces in the country who are going to decide who are going to be the candidate. And we have to be in agreement about who that candidate will be against Maduro. And so it's the dictator who cannot be, the dictator cannot be choosing our candidate. 
sin duda, muchos de los que nos están viendo. Know, clearly many of those who are watching us today in Washington or in other areas in the international community have questions for you about your economic policy, your position on the economy. If you were elected, what would your priorities be in order to deal or address the inequality in the economy and to recover economic growth in the country? Si hay un sector, un, un rol clave Is para there el... a key role for the private sector in this recovery? Yes, the first I should say is I'm a center right and I believe very firmly in free market as a mechanism to be able to get us out of the economic crisis that my country finds itself in. First of all, it is clear that I do not agree with those candidates who say that if they get into power today, they could put an end uh, or make changes, for example, like a minimum wage in Venezuela, they could do that tomorrow. That's not something that can be done so quickly. For example, inflation and stagnation, we can't achieve salaries in Venezuela that are sufficient. That is to say, right now, the minimum wage makes no sense because even if I increase it tomorrow, then we have problems with inflation the day after. So what we really need to do is reactivate the economy. We have to start up the national apparatus. Basically, what we consume is always coming from imports. And for example, I just came from the state of Tachira. It's incredibly painful to see how the population consumes more Colombian products than Venezuelan products. And that is a product of Colombian products being increasingly cheaper than the domestic products that are produced now. What are the reasons for this? There's many different reasons. For example, we've got a situation where we talk about matraca. Matraca, what that means is basically a bribe, a kind of corruption where public officials in the in the military are essentially bribing producers, either with money or with important parts of the products that they are transporting from one state to another within the country. That clearly means that the prices are increased because of this in terms of domestic products. And in Venezuela, we also don't have a credit system. In Venezuela, we don't have any kind of support for private industry. And in fact, what we say that there is a vicious cycle of poverty. And it began within the socialist policies from the uh, late President Chavez, where there was no private property anymore. And once the private property was eliminated, then they also eliminated national production. And step by step, that's how we get to a stage where now we don't even know what the public accounts are like. Today, we don't know what the national budget is in our country. We don't know what our GDP is. There are no data available. We don't even have data on oil production. So we need to create the conditions so that we can receive international investment, foreign investment, and so that private investment can understand that they can have trust the Venezuelan economy. We understand that the economy is based on trust and confidence, but that is not based on just you know outreaching to individuals we need to make sure that we have and we actually have a group of laws that are going to support foreign investment now in terms of oil industry or the oil industry in our country i don't agree with those people who say that we need to sell off part of this tomorrow now that is obviously a proposal that is on the table but our oil industry is in a terrible situation. If we sell Perevesa, then we would basically be selling off the country. So I think we need, at least in the first stage, we need to make sure that we can recover our oil industry, oil sector, and make sure that we have significant investment in that industry as well. Now, we have a plan called more routes and more opportunities. That plan means that we need to create within Venezuela those opportunities that our individuals or citizens need. And if we are able to 
grow the roots, that is to say, within our country, with the opportunities that could come from this, we will then be able to see that those who come from the outside in come back to Venezuela. If we ask them to invest in Pelevesa, for example, and they want a certain percentage of their employees are Venezuelan, then what we will manage to do is have a lot of people who will come back to Venezuela because of those opportunities. So again, we must recover our national productive apparatus. We need to promote national domestic production. And little by little, we need to end this style of renting or leasing. And we need to make sure that there's legal certainty for investors. And these are really fundamental to improve the economy and recover the economy in our country. Thank you so much. From 2021, the Unitary Platform has been negotiating with the Maduro regime on what is known is the Me in what is known as the Mexico process. In that process, in those negotiations, there have been some partial agreements, and there is a humanitarian passive agreement that was signed in November of last year. And in fact, we just saw that some of the members of the negotiating team for the Unitory platform are in Brussels participating in meetings with the presidents of France, Brazil, and Colombia, if I am correct. How optimistic are you with respect to those negotiations? Do you believe that there is a role uh, or do you think that that process has a role in the changing things for Venezuela? Well, no, I'm not optimistic. In fact, our party does not uh, participate on that team, in that negotiations team. And that doesn't mean that I don't believe in the need for negotiation. It means that I don't think that this is the time and I don't think it's the correct negotiation. It's not the first time that we have a mechanism like this. In 2014, for example, there was a dialogue uh, process that started and I participated in it. In fact, I promoted it. No, I wasn't just a part of the political team that was meeting with the high authorities or high up authorities of the regime. And I do think that one of the most difficult things that I've done in my life at one point, and I'll say it again today, but then we did have working groups and I was tasked with working on human rights where we were trying to uh, achieve the freedom of political prisoners. And we really had to disband at one point because the government wasn't complying with anything, nothing that they committed to. And the regime has used over all of these years the negotiation mechanisms as a means of gaining time and of whitewashing their view, their their what they look like in the international community. And obviously, when people are in a democracy, when you have a conversation between the government and the opposition, that's quite natural. And when you're in the de in democracy and that is a crisis, for example, a humanitarian complex, and that doesn't usually happen in democracies, but when that does occur, if there's a crisis of that kind, they can be resolved using dialogue and there wouldn't be a need if we were in democracy, we wouldn't need to come to this kind of agreement, quote unquote agreements that are being achieved. The Maduro regime is using these mechanisms of negotiation to basically gain time and again, whitewash themselves. And I wish it were possible for any agreements that come out of this to begin to solve the humanitarian crisis that is happening in our country. I wish that these kinds of agreements would not be politicized and that they would be effective and they could be used to benefit the country that is suffering, that can't wait for there to be a solution to the critical po the political crisis. They need to put food on their table. They need to make sure that they have basic access to health services. But honestly, all of these issues, all of these problems that are happening in our country are only going to be resolved when there is a change in government. You've just mentioned that there are differences within the opposition in Venezuela in terms of the negotiations, in terms of many different uh, topics, uh, economic topics, political topics. It is no secret that the unity between the different factions in the opposition has been a challenge, uh, and a significant challenge. How can we actually have effective unity within the opposition? That is to say, how can we achieve this unity, a kind of unity that has been so elusive? 
I think the first thing has to do with uh, taking a look at ourselves, being introspective, there, that making sure that there are not personal interests. I mean, I think they're all legitimate, that there is, they can't be personal interests that is more important than the national interest. And I think that that's step one. Number two, we need to understand what how important unity is. And to me, that is absolutely essential. I believe very firmly in unity. And I believe also that once we have democracy in Venezuela, the opportunities will be there for all Democrats. That is to say, this isn't the last opportunity, the last option that we have for any of us as candidates, but it could be the last opportunity for Venezuela as a country. So what we really need to look for or seek is the freedom of this country, not defending ourselves individually as politicians. And that I think is critical. Also, I feel like we need to understand that it's healthy to think differently. It's absolutely healthy because otherwise, then I guess we'd be dictators as well. The challenge here under these circumstances, under dictatorship under which we are living in Venezuela is that thinking differently, but doing it together and using those differences in order to find our common points that will eventually be a benefit to the nation. And the last issue is the primary ele elections, and they are essential because it's going to be up to the citizens to participate in the building of that unity. That means that whoever wins, uh, male or female, and I'm saying in both because I as aspire to win the primaries, that they are going to have legitimacy from those elections and they're going to have the responsibility to unite the country, to unite democratic forces and to deny, unite the country together. And they are going to together with the rest of the candidates because they are all extremely important. And I don't believe that there's a single candidate out there who's more important or above the others. They might receive more votes than the other, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are le more or less important, but that all candidates after the 22nd of October will be critical, important, or all of our teams will be important to make sure that within unity, within that framework, we're able to get the kinds of conditions that will allow us to compete, to win, and to govern. Yes. Thank you very much. The idea was also to offer you the opportunity to take questions, not just from me, but from others who are joining us today. We have a number of different journalists joining us in this afternoon's event, and I'm certain they are very anxious to hear your opinion on a number of different topics. Perhaps we could get started with Regina Garcia, a correspondent in Venezuela for the Associated Press. Thank you so much for being with us today. Hi, Jeff. Thank you for that invitation. And candidate Solorzano, thank you for agreeing to take some of our questions today. I wanted to go back to what Jeff was saying just a few moments ago. That what you brought up during the debate that was to have a list of successor or what will be done if the regime or the government continues to disqualify one candidate after another. Are there conversations ongoing amongst the candidates or anyone who has shown any sort of interest in, in this during the debate? You have also, or we've heard talk a lot about election conditions. What do you think are the three or four most important conditions that must be in place? Of course, there could be many more that may need to be negotiated with the government. And would you all come to an agreement on what those conditions need to be? Uh, thank you so much, Regina. First, when it comes to this, I am hoping to enter into discussions with all of our all of the primary candidates. We want to do this in an organic fashion. Today, we had 
scheduled a meeting. We had to postpone it because I had a commitment to be here, but that will happen. But we need to be prepared. And all together, we have to discuss the matter of succession. And we'll say publicly, I'm not suggesting a list or any specific order because if somebody wants to show opposition, what would that be done? It's because this would be fodder for the administration post October 22nd to use against us. So I would say it's very important to make our strategy public. We must be prepared. And what is more, it's because I think I am in a position to win the primary. I'm not going to say there can't be a succession list because I'm going to win and I should just win or take all. No, I have to put the country first. This is key. If Venezuela is put at the forefront, then we know we have to eliminate the dictatorship. It would be very inconsistent if I would would support the dictatorship. We have 300 political prisoners who I am representing. I don't think we can give any leeway to the dictatorship. This is a, not a mechanism to defend myself, and I don't want to take the Venezuelan people down an uncharted path. What I'm doing is proposing a path toward the election. And with that, I will go to the second part of your question. The conditions, the conditions are those that are part of the EU's report. And this was also part of the petitions for all of those who are sitting down in Mexico to negotiate, for example, stopping disqualifying candidates or and also technical conditions that are very important, review and auditing of electoral voter registries. And there are many people still living abroad and voters abroad because more than 300 thousand Venezuelans should have to, should be able to vote in the primary elections. But if they don't open up the voter registry, then we can't do that. There have to be all of the audits in place. Look at what happened last November 21st with Marmac said that fraud had occurred in 2018 during the election of Maduro. They stated openly that there had been fraud. We have to accept all of the audits that will allow us to ensure the right to vote. This is not reinventing the wheel. All of the conditions are in the EU's report and the Maduro regime itself even invited the EU to do that and to be involved in the process. So they should accept those conditions. Okay, thanks. We have Joe Daniels, who is a correspondent for Los Andes of the Financial Times. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, candidate Solosano. In the past 20 years, the Venezuelan military have become increasingly involved in economic, political, and criminal structures in the country. My question is, were you to be elected, what, what would your relationship be with the military in those areas? Thank you. I love that question. I think first we have to draw distinction between the senior command and the lower command. For example, recently, in the promotions that President Maduro has, uh, has agreed to, some of these people have been accused of crimes against humanity, and these are part of the case before the International Criminal Court. And it was clear that that it is clear that much of Venezuela has is under the control of armed criminal groups. In the 
we have areas of the country that are in very severe a situation because of what the regime has done. Then we also have the Colombia Venezuela border and then the Brazil Venezuela border. Much of the territory is under the control of criminal groups. And they do this in, with the support of the military. So Maduro, and there are at least 19 mega criminal gangs working from the Tren de Aragua, the Tren de Llano. These are criminal groups operating in, in the capital, and they've completely hijacked uh, the territory of Venezuela. And this is all under the Maduro regime. The national military controls weapons. Not anyone can just go out and purchase whatever weapon they want. If you have one, it has to be with the green light of the military. So what do we do? We have to eliminate complicity. They have, the military has to do their job. Right now, they are not fighting to protect the country. There was an they were talking about the alleged murder of another guerrilla leader within Venezuela. And I say alleged because I haven't seen the body and therefore cannot come to the conclusion that this did in fact transpire. It's alleged. In theory, they're being murdered after clashes or they're being murdered by other criminal elements, but not the military. The But the military is not fighting against them. And if they're not doing that, it's because they haven't received the order to do so. So this is what we're seeing all along the borders and from corner to corner in Venezuela. So anyone who has the vocation to join the military, it's because they seek peace, not violence. The honor that the military used to enjoy has been completely besmirched. It's, this is those who have been holding power for a quarter of a century. It's just simply rotated. It's it's kind of like musical chairs where they're all moving from one high position to another. So for a quarter of a century, what they're doing is merging the honor of the Venezuelan military. We are compelled to return honor to our national armed forces and in doing so they have to understand that their job is to combat these criminal bands in the territory and what we cannot have is an administration that is an accomplice to the violence of the military so i'm going to turn things over to ariana itriago a journalist for bloomberg news thank you candidate solorsono for this opportunity to ask you a question i wanted to dovetail on the question that my colleague regina said the meeting that you were going to have with the candidates uh, will, will all opposition candidates be involved, like Enrique Capriles, who was not at last week's debate, and what type of discussion things will items will be on the agenda besides succession? What do you think the priorities are, and will you have? regularly scheduled meetings beyond this one. I also wanted to ask you about the disqualifications in the context of these electoral decisions being made by the Maduro government. They said that they were going to announce disqualifications of other opposition candidates in addition to the matter of the European Union and uh, electoral observation. What is your position on this? No, thank you. 
I obviously cannot be a spokesperson for this meeting. That is not my role. I cannot speak on behalf of the other candidates either. What I can do is give you my personal opinion. I believe that we should have regular meetings and they don't need to be public meetings. If there's one thing we've learned over the years is that every time there's a public meeting, we never reach any type of conclusion. I believe that we have to have the real and true will to reach agreement. We have to put our differences aside. In, in democratic institutions, decisions are made by majority, sometimes unan unanimity. In the unitary platform, which appointed the Committee on Primary Elections and created a framework, therefore, it has made a number of proposals. First, to have primary elections, and secondly, have Venezuelans abroad be able to vote because the Maduro regime didn't, does not want them. And it should be uh, two different rounds, a first one and a runoff. I am involved in the process. These are the mechanisms and democratic institutions. It's not because something that we propose is if that's not accepted by everyone, that person's just going to pick up and leave. That's not what we're doing. We're talking about the order of succession, have a, um, a press conference, and this was very controversial, but I say that I do believe this is something that needs to be done. And I'm not talking about a scaled one, two, three, four, five, six. What we have to do is determine what we are going to do should it, it, the Nicaragua scenario, as some people call it, were to happen. I call it the Venezuela scenario. It's the because it's the Venezuelan regime. If we go back to 12, 2012, uh, Leopoldo Lopez was disqualified, even though the Inter-American Court of Human Rights decided that he could not be disqualified. And that's because this was something that would have to apply to all those who had been qualified. But of course, the government of Venezuela decided to simply abandon the inter-American system so that it would not have to respect that decision. So the political pressure was there and they were able to imprison Leopoldo Lopez. The Nicaraguan regime has been copying what the Venezuelan regime has done. So of the 14, several have been disqualified. And we have to discuss this. We have to be prepared for it. And how are we going to agree to that? Well, I don't have any, you know, crystal ball to know, but we have to be prepared. Again, these disqualifications are unconstitutional, as well as Fred Superlano's disqualification in the Guarino state was also unconstitu un unconstitutional. So these three were also unconstitutional. So let's go back to the platform that we have. The fourth proposal from our platform was to allow the participation of those who had been disqualified because we believe that it is unconstitutional. And if the regime violates human rights, then we're not here to replicate that violation of human rights. We are here to guarantee rights. And it was a proposal that we made and I, that's a proposal that we made. We want to make sure that we are protecting the constitution. Now, if the regime or the dictatorship continues to work against candidates, yes, that's what they're going to do. And that's why we're proposing that there would be a plant secession plan. Now, tomorrow, anything could happen. It's true, which again, that's why we are proposing that there be a succession plan and we might change and we might call it something else, whatever you want to call it, it doesn't matter, but we need to be prepared for the dictatorship to behave as a dictatorship. We can't expect them to behave uh, as a democracy. Thank you so much. Those were the key questions that we had given the current situation and the current uh, times that Venezuela finds themselves in. 
o sea, yo quiero agradecerle a, a... I wanted to thank the journalists who came to join us in this conversation today, and I also wanted to thank you, Madam Candidate, for your participation in today's event. We know that Venezuela today is at a crossroads. We know that it is a, a nation dreaming of change and that they really believe in democratic principles and these are fundamental for their identity. Our idea, our concept behind organizing this event series of visions for change really is looking at the different multifaceted dimensions of this struggle and to highlight the efforts of the Venezuelan people as they search for a free and prosperous country. Our idea is not just about listening to speeches, it's about fomenting dialogue, conversation, and collaboration. And that's why we are so grateful to you for participating today. And you particularly, Madam Candidate, thank you so much again. We would also like to thank everyone who joined the conversation today. We'll be announcing future events in this lecture series or conversation series over the next few weeks. Thank you so much, Madam Solosono, for your participation. And thank you to all of you who have connected today online. Thank you so much to you as well.